I speak to you here as a media, but I want to speak directly to the national community, the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago. So um, this press conference is taking place, and I will focus on one issue. And that issue is the CLECO CL Financial, mainly CL, CL Financial, not so much CLECO, but CL Financial, but I have to make reference to the existence of, of CLECO, a matter which has been before the court and a matter which has quite properly attracted the attention of the national community in a way that is not normal. There has been many, many days of very active public debate and public interest in this matter. And some aspect of it might still be before the court, so I would have to be very circumspect with respect to how I treat with the issue. But it does not prevent me from informing the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago about how their business has been or is being attended. Permit me to respond to a lot of what took place in the last week in the national community in terms of the national conversation on radio, in the newspapers, columnists, influential people speaking and so on. And the one body that was silent was the government. And the reason why we had to be silent is because the government had gone to court to take an action which was a very serious action. And we were being advised quite properly by good quality lawyers that the government should not be saying much at this time while the matter is before the court, lest the government's statements become part of the um, deliberations of the court. So we had to be silent while a lot was being said by many people. And it being a free society, people are free to take their positions. But this morning, this afternoon, as head of the government, I want to take this opportunity to address a few of these issues for the benefit of the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago. And let me back up a bit um, before I get into the substance of it. Just to remind you, because it appears as though many people have forgotten where we came from, where we have come from on these issues. I was a member of the Manning government. And for the benefit of one of the spokespersons on the other side of this issue, who on last weekend, when in chastising the government and chastising me personally on the government's position on this matter, for the benefit of the record, I was not a member of the Manning cabinet when the Clico bailout took place. I was a member of the Manning government. I was a backbencher because I left the cabinet. In fact, let me put it correctly. I was dismissed from the cabinet in April of 2008. The bailout took place, I think, in January of 2009. So while I was a member of the government, I was not a member of the cabinet. And when that urgent matter arose on that fateful day, as a member of the government and as a backbencher in the matter, there were two issues that attracted my attention. One was the government's request for financial support for a private company. And I want this to go into the psyche of the taxpayer. Clico and CLF are private entities for the benefit of their shareholders. Those shareholders came to the government for taxpayers' money so that they could continue their business. They got into financial difficulty and they came to the government for financial help. And by government here, whenever I say government in this conversation I'm having now, the statement I'm going to make, 
Whenever I say government, I want you to read taxpayer. They came to the government for financial help because there was a worldwide problem happening and this company had a difficulty and the government assessed the situation. From where I sat at the time, having to vote on this issue as to whether taxpayers should bail out this private company, I insisted that I be told how much money might be involved. Interestingly enough, the current Minister of Finance was the leader of government business then. And he had a responsibility to get this matter through the parliament. When I asked the question of how much, how much, how much taxpayer money would be involved in bailing out this private company and the investors in this company, I was told approximately $5 billion. Because up to that point, I had refused to take a position unless I had an idea as to what was involved. And $5 billion was the figure that came up. And this agreement. And secondly, on the day when the matter came to the parliament, I refused to vote with the PNM government, of which I was a part, on this matter. Unless, of course, I had been given assurances that the bank shares would not go to NIB, where Calder Hart was the chairman. And on that matter, I, as a PNM backbencher, refused to vote with the PNM government on this bailout matter. And there was an adjournment. And if you want a little bit more of our history, when I took that position, which is quite unusual in this country, the Prime Minister then, Prime Minister Manning, called a meeting of the opposition to seek to get their support to have the bailout done. Halfway through that meeting when government and opposition sat on the same table, the Prime Minister realized that this was not going to work and the meeting was abandoned. And then a meeting of the government took place immediately after, which I attended. And I was being attacked by some of my colleagues for not towing the line as PNM MP and voting blindly as I should. And I refused. However, when an assurance was given that the bank shares would not go to NIB under called the heart control, and that a figure of $5 billion is the approximate figure of the bailout, I agreed to vote on this matter. And that is how the bailout took place at the time. So it is really galling to me to have those who are influencing public opinion at this time that we're dealing with this matter eight years or so after, to be getting up and telling the country that the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago was a member of the cabinet that approved the bailout, and now we are betraying black people in Trinidad and Tobago and the Black People Company. And I mention that to let you know that the issue in front of us is not about black, blue, white, or yellow. It's about the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago and money is loaned to a private entity. We came into government in September. So I became Prime Minister September 9th, 2015. And soon after, we started to inquire as to what was the situation with respect to this matter. We had been told by other governments before, other prime, other prime ministers and ministers of finance, that the matter was settled. However, because we knew that at least one of those companies, Angostura, was a very profitable company and must have been earning substantial sums of money. Somewhere along the line, the gov this government started to ask questions. What is happening to the Angostura earnings? Because up to recently, I think up to must be just about a week or so ago, the record would show that there was only one payment that came to the government as a repayment for the debt owed in the bailout arrangements. That payment came accidentally. It was not an arrangement payment or part of any process of repayment. What happened was that the methanol plant, attempts were made to sell the methanol plant. 
outside of the arrangements of the bylaws of that company. And the minority shareholder, a company called Proman, the minority shareholder took the government to arbitration over the government's intention to sell that plant without giving the minority shareholder its rights of first refusal. The government fought that matter and lost it. And the arbitrator instructed that the methanol plant, one of them, be sold. That sale took place and the proceeds came to the government about seven and a half billion dollars. That is the only monies that came to the state up until a few days ago. So then it is wrong to say that the government has been raiding these companies and using them for budget support. That impression was given and supported all weekend by persons who are not in the know, who claim to be in the know, and who were misinforming the national community. There's one particular um, radio host who speak completely without any information. And because we were silent on the matter last week, and last weekend, the population would have been led to believe that the government, including this government, has been raiding these companies for budget support. Except for that, methan that, that methanol sale that came from the arbitration, a debt of $23 billion, and I want to use the word approximately, $23 billion saw a repayment of $7.5 billion. So there were $15 billion there unattended for years. The Minister of Finance has just advised me that recently we received one other payment of about $500 million from Angostura. But prior to that, when you go back to the point of this government inquiring and trying to find out what was happening in these companies with respect to the government debt and their ability and intention to repay. When we started to inquire, there was great difficulty in getting information because, as you would have observed in the court proceedings and other information last week, there are no audited financial statements of these companies. And of course, there are those who would lay that at the, at the doorstep of this government, but suffice it to say that we have only just arrived. There are no audited financial statements. So we couldn't just go to the financial statements and find out. We had to ask those who were running the companies to tell us what is the financial status and give us the financial um, statements of these companies. And we, en we encountered a lot of difficulty for months. When we eventually got, I would say, the information, what we received was very alarming. The gist of it is that Angostura, a company that was making hundreds of millions of dollars in profit, the government was asking, where are those profits going? Because we had an interest in being repaid for taxpayers' money. We found out in recent weeks that the Angostura profits was going to a company in Scotland called CL World Brands, purportedly owned 100% by shareholders who were bailed out by the government. But when we examined the fact, we discovered that that company did not own 100% of those profits. And in fact, 60% of it was owned by other entities. Yet, the profits were going abroad and created a pool of funds for persons outside of the government's glare. When we discovered that, the government was so alarmed by this development that we took steps to have action taken against persons, one particular person, who was responsible for facilitating this. And we set about to ensure that there's rectification so that the Angostura profits, which I think 60% I think belongs to CIB and Clico, so only 40% was, was 
are due to this company in Scotland. But when we started prying in this way and forced this information, something happened. The people who we bailed out, the shareholders, private shareholders who were bailed out by taxpayers' money, took the position that the government must get off the board. When the bailout took place in 2009, one of the conditions of putting taxpayer money into this private company for a bailout to create a continuation of their life was that they will sign a shareholders agreement, meaning that the shareholders would agree that the board of the company would be majority government and the government would hold the chairmanship while taxpayer money was injected to the tune of approximately $23 billion eventually. That shareholder agreement was meant to last for three years because the intention was that in three years, the company would have been in a position to repay the government and not need um, government support and so on. But that also was against the background that you were dealing with the $5 billion CLECO policy arrangement. When the new government came in, in 2010, the issue of what is to happen to those persons who had taken part in the short-term investment, high-yielding, uh, what's called short-term, flexible policies, what is to happen to them? One point of view in this country expressed by members of the last cabinet, namely Minister Patrick Watson, who told this country that that was a Ponzi scheme and persons who took part in it ought to stand their losses. Other persons in the national community had a similar view, that persons went after high yield and there was high risk and if there was failure, they must stand their bounce. The last government did not agree with that and said under Minister Dukaran that those persons would be made whole and persons recovered their monies. And it was $11 billion of taxpayer money that was used as further injection into this private company to discharge their private liabilities but funded by the taxpayer of Trinidad and Tobago. That is how the figure moved from $11 billion to $23 billion. The shareholder agreement expired after three years and the situation with the company had been no better. In fact, the debt situation was quite alarming. And the agreement was extended, I'm told, 17 times. Every time it expired, the shareholders and the government agreed to extend it further because the relationship continued. Come August 2016, and this government is in office, just about a year, and the shareholders decided at that time that they will not extend the agreement the shareholders agreement, which gave the government, the taxpayer, some protection for this large sum of money which had been moved from the treasury into this private company. We were very patient, very reasonable in talking to them. And the next thing I know as prime minister, I go to the parliament and the opposition puts a question to me as to whether in fact that shareholders agreement has been signed. If you were paying attention, then you would have heard. I had to respond in the parliament where the bailout took place to tell the parliament that the shareholders agreement has not been signed. And the government is seeking to encourage the shareholders to sign the agreement so that the taxpayers can be protected going forward. The shareholders were adamant that they will not sign the shareholders agreement. That shareholders agreement is tantamount to, is an IOU. That's what it is. And on top of that, the demand that the government withdraw its directors from the board was tantamount to a hostile takeover. Where the government and taxpayers have been removed, no shareholder agreement in place to cover the money, and the government directors removed from the board. Somehow the shareholders felt that that was something 
that is required to be done at this point in time. The government refused to cooperate with, an, with accepting that there should be no shareholder agreement and the government refused to cooperate with the request to remove the government's directors. The shareholders then proceeded under law to call a special general meeting of the uh, special AGM with a view to appoint their own directors, additional directors, which would have put the government in a minority position and in violation of the terms at which the bailout took place in 2009. Because the shareholders' agreement in 2009 required, as stated in that agreement, that the government's directors would be the majority on the board. So for the government to acquiesce now to the shareholders coming at this point in time, owing $15 billion to taxpayers, and either expelling the government's directors from the board or allowing the board to fall under the control of uh, the directors appointed by the shareholders, in the eyes of this cabinet, would have been a dereliction of duty on the part of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to ask a question of the people of Trinidad and Tobago who last week, particularly last weekend, were encouraged and had a lot to say about the government's actions. When the shareholders moved to expel the government from this situation, and by government I mean you, the taxpayer, when the private shareholders of a private company that was bailed out by taxpayers, when they moved to take over the company and to expel your representative, the government, what did you expect the government to do? Would it have been proper for the government to allow this to happen and leave $15 billion of taxpayers' money unprotected against all reason and against the documentation that caused taxpayers' money to have gone into that company in the first place? And let me explain to you a nuance of this. We have been downgraded earlier in the year. And when the country is downgraded, what it means for every citizen is that our circumstances worsened. Because if we have to borrow money as we have to, we have to pay more for that money. Those who do the downgrading, they look at your assets and your liabilities, your receivables and your expenses. One of the receivables that they would look at is the billions owed to us in that arrangement with CLECO and CLF. And we take into account whether it's a receivable and against what kind of background and time frame any or all of it can be returned to the taxpayer through the government. If we as a government had allowed for that 15 billion to end up in a situation where there was no protection for it, no regime for repayment that was reasonable, and that the company that we bailed out would have fallen back into the hands of those who, in the first place, came for the bailout and who have not improved their position, those who would have made a decision on the circumstance of the government of Trinidad and Tobago would most certainly have used that as grounds for further downgrade of Trinidad and Tobago against anything else that might downgrade us. Because we would now have $15 billion that we had no reasonable arrangement, no debenture, no shareholders agreement, and no majority on the board. And that alone required the government to act to protect not just that $15 billion, but to protect the entire financial scene for Trinidad and Tobago. Now, when the $5 billion was lent in the beginning, I mentioned to you earlier when I was in the back bench agreeing to it, the government that agreed to that, that $5 billion attracted interest because it's money being made available and those companies are companies designed to make a profit somewhere along the line. And the, ex the expectation was that in three years' time, all would be well with them. And the taxpayer lent you $5 billion. And a, 
and interest would apply. However, something strange happened. When the $11 billion was added to that financial support, the Minister of Finance at that time entered into an agreement that that $11 billion, well, not even 11 all except the first $5 billion, would attract no interest. And let me point out to you what that means. Let me point out to you, the taxpayer, what that means. It means that those who receive that money, attracting no interest, have no incentive to pay you back. Because the longer they take to pay it, the better off they are. And if eventually they pay you in year not or year 2000, you get paid in further devalued dollars because over time money has less and less value. And if it's attracting no interest, it means that they have an interest in not paying you. Whereas if it was attracting interest, they will be owing more money the longer they take to pay. And there will be an incentive to repay. But you, the taxpayer, provided 23, 23 billion minus 7, all of that without interest. But that money didn't just come from money you had in a pot. When that money was being made available, the government of Trinidad and Tobago was carrying debt. We always had public debt, money we borrow. The government of Trinidad and Tobago was borrowing money to conduct your business. Every single cent that we have borrowed and every single piece of debt that we were carrying, you, the taxpayer, were paying interest on it. Some of that interest is as high as 9%. Some 4%, some 6%, depending on where the money came from and how long you had it and so on. So what is the scenario that we faced last week and the week before? Here it is. You, the taxpayer, borrowing money. That money is in the public sector, in the treasury. You then make that money available to a private company for private shareholders without interest. And you, the taxpayer, paying interest. What is 4% interest on, 20, on 15 billion? What is 5% or 2% interest on 15 billion that you will never get? But you are paying that wherever you borrowed money to make it available to that. And I tell you this, so that a lot of the conversations that took place here in the last week, especially last weekend, would be put in its correct perspective that all that has happened here is that the taxpayer has made taxpayer money available to bail out a private company and the private company took action to which the government had to react. And I want to address the allegations made against this government. That one, we covet the companies and want to run the, government, the, the people company. This government, and I dare say the previous government, had no interest in running these private companies. And this government certainly does not covet these beautiful companies that are up to the eyeball in debt and owe the government $15 billion that they can pay, I hope. So there's no, there's no talk about us wanting to run the people's companies. What we want to do is to ensure that the taxpayer money that went into these private companies is protected and there's a reasonable chance of the taxpayer getting back that money. The next thing, even more ridiculous, made by mischief makers in this country, is that the government has some secret plan to break up these companies and sell these beautiful assets to friends and finances of the government. I want to give taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago and the country citizens the assurance that there is absolutely no truth in that statement or that position. This government has no intention of conniving with any person in the 1%, in 
in the 10%, in the 100%, no person, agency or otherwise, to dispose of these assets. All this government is interested in is ensuring that these entities are in a position to discharge their liability to the taxpayer. The question about what has gone on which caused the government to go to court. The government having discovered, as I told you a while ago, what was going on in these companies, took sound quality legal advice as to how taxpayers could proceed to protect themselves from this development and the action taken by the shareholders. The legal advice we got told us that the thing to do is to go to the court for a provisional liquidator. And as a responsible government, we took some legal advice. Those of you who might have been exposed to or who took the trouble to read the judgment, I'm surprised that up to now the judgment has not been published for the public. It's only, it's only a page and a half, I think it was a page. A page and three quarter. And I, I would like to ask the media to publish the judgment. Because you see, there were experts on the media telling the country that this is a fire sale that the government is engineering, completely ignoring the fact that the government was reacting to the actions being taken by the shareholders who owe taxpayers $15 billion. And the condition under which we went under some legal advice, was that if you go to the court and you get a provisional liquidator, it now becomes a matter for the court. The provisional liquidator becomes now an officer of the court. The provisional liquidator, that the government, which is being accused of wanting to dispose of these assets to their friends and so on, can't happen. Anything that happens will happen under the eyes of the court and look at what the court has approved and you will understand that I'm not just making this up. The court has granted that provisional liquidator who I must say is already on the job but with specific powers under the rule of the court. And of course we have to ensure that whatever was going on doesn't continue without the knowledge and consent of the government. Because you see, when we pried into this matter, adamant that the government must be satisfied on behalf of taxpayers, that where monies are being earned in this grouping of companies, that those monies are used in a certain way, and the government's interest, taxpayer interest, is protected, we found out we, the government found out, found out, over and above where the profits from Angostura was going, that unbeknownst to the government, the cabinet, people were settling private sector debt at 43 cents on the dollar, resulting in significant losses to the taxpayer. We didn't know that. We just found that out a few weeks ago. So the government has to be aware of what is going on if there is to be protection of the taxpayers' monies. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the long and short of the whole situation. No malice, no conspiracy, and certainly no avarice with respect to these companies. There's one final point I want to comment on. You see the discussion that took place here last week about this black man company and this black company and that this black government betraying black people? I take serious umbrage at that. And I tell you why. It was Eric Williams who wrote that the blackest thing in slavery was not the black man. And for all of you who want to talk about black man and black man this and black man that, 
I might be the blackest man in Trinidad and Tobago. So black that when I was made leader of the PNM, some of the very voices now that talking about black man company and being betrayed by black man, the argument then was that I couldn't lead the party and I couldn't lead the country because I was too black. I am of the same color today. And that folly must be exposed and dismissed for what it is. Because that is the kind of foolishness that gets the taxpayer to join like a turkey voting for Thanksgiving. You see? Because when taxpayers should be here supporting the government to protect the taxpayer's money, there are people encouraging the taxpayer to have its monies exposed without the venture, without interest, without protection, and to have its only representative, the government, kicked off the board of the companies. And if, after what I've said here today, the people of Trinidad and Tobago who are taxpayers don't understand what you're dealing with, all I will say to you, trust me. Any questions? Uh, Prime Minister, um the fundamentals that you put forward is very good because you said that the boards are controlled at this time up to the time when, when the decision made not to renew or couldn't renew that the board members that the majority was the government board members the arrangement before one cent of taxpayer money went into this private company this private conglomerate those who made that decision to put taxpayer money into this private conglomerate was under the condition that the government, taxpayer, the government is the taxpayer representative, would sign a shareholders agreement where the shareholders would sign and agree that to get this money, the government would have the majority on the board and that this agreement would be in place and in force. The question is, is that in place is the boards now, prior to this problem, did the government have the majority of the board members? Yes, yes. it was four to three. So it follows the next question, which is the one that I'm concerned more about. Under the due diligence rules of co corporate governance, a company can only pay out dividends if the shareholders agree, not if the directors agree and make a recommendation to the shareholders as to what must be paid. If that is the case, then there is an erring in the responsibility of the four people that you have appointed. Because they would not have been able to get the I approval to pay those dividends that Angus Rupio if those directors did not agree. And that is the rules. I told you when I started this press conference that is taking place under very unusual circumstances. What you said there makes a lot of sense and might even be fact. But from this podium this afternoon, I won't engage you on that. Those matters will come on the spotlight and the population will be advised as we go forward. I have no information at this point in time to assist you with that question. So can we take it that if those people uh, that don't, are don't, there... Don't take it other than what I've given you. So will action be taken by the government and those directors? Don't take it other than what I've given you. I am not going any further than what I have said or what I'm prepared to say from this podium. If there are other difficulties like the one you've outlined and others, they will surface. They will surface. The shareholders agreement was extended 17 times in the last couple of years. Was there any particular reason given this time by the shareholders group why they refused to sign? Yeah, the, um, the reason that they gave was that the, um, the government was mismanaging the company and that the company had more assets and the assets were being hidden and just reasons like that, that it was time that they take back the company. Right? It was that those were the sort of... Oh, and let me just mention one point. Up to this morning, I heard one of the voices of the interested parties telling the national population, the beleaguered taxpayer, that what has been happening is that the government, and, and I think they said governments, including this one, had been feasting at the trough of these companies. In other words, raiding these companies. I trust from what I've told you, you would see that that is not true at all. 
if there's any feasting that was taking place, it was on that side of the coin. And against what Mr. Amara has just raised, I would go no further on that. Because clearly, for any feasting to take place, certain feast directors and ring masters had to have um, controlled it. I say no more on that for the moment. Managed by a CEO who was instructed the CEO to, to pay these monies. Good question. I don't have the answer. But what we do know that when the government found out what was happening, the government ensured that action was taken to end at least some part of that. But we are, it's not the beginning of the end, it's the end of the beginning in some, in some ways on this matter. How much money was transferred to that company, the foreign company? We're talking money? about substantial sums of money. I, can't, I wouldn't want to give you the figure. I'm sure the Minister of Finance from here on in, because I don't propose to be the, um, the, the, the town crier on this matter. I, I had this press conference today to talk to the taxpayer, and, now, and I would leave it to the Minister of Finance and whoever else is authorized to speak after. But today I felt, especially after what went on here last week, into the weekend, when the government could not have responded because you were before the court, I thought today I will talk to the taxpayer. I know the hard part about it. This whole thing, you know, it, 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 it came down to a racial conversation. But in fact, it was a haves and have not conversation. When I say taxpayer in this country, I represent the oath of office I took, represent 1.4 million people in this country, every single one of them, whatever color, whatever shape, whatever location. Those who are beneficiaries in this matter are the fortunate few and might even be part of the 1% for all you know. And those who stand to lose the most are those who, when they go to the hospital, there's no medication there because the Minister of Finance can't pay for it. And those who don't have a bus because we can't buy new buses and so on and so on and so on. So this talk right, about the taxpayer Today's press conference, I'm speaking directly to Mr. and Mrs. Taxpayer in Trinidad and Tobago. Fire sale, uh, or that, that, that's not the, the term that you would use or so on. What exactly the is that? The fire sale implied, the fire sale misinformation implied a conspiracy on the part, not even not implied, stated a conspiracy on the part of the government, all of us in government, to give friends and financiers the other people, the people's company. I thought I said enough on that. Yeah, well, I just wanted to, to clarification, Prime Minister, on the government's intention with regard to the liquidation petition in other words. You, you are a very advanced member of the media. I am really asking you to read, read the order of the court. And you will see this fire steel story is just so much hui. And it's meant, it's meant to misdirect the exposed taxpayer. So, Prime Minister, Prime Minister, the question was, what is the government's intention therefore in terms of the, the issue of liquidation? Okay. Let me just tell you, let me go over it again, because you seem to be having some difficulty. I'll say it very slowly. The only intention of the government of Trinidad and Tobago is to protect the assets of the taxpayer of Trinidad and Tobago which were injected into a private company, and this government, by virtue of its oath of office, will do everything that is reasonable and possible to ensure that there is a likelihood of the taxpayer recovering that money. How would, it be, safe, would it be safe to say that you have very little comfort that, the, that these so-called assurances from the shareholders that they can pay back this $15 billion or that they can... Well, I'm it. glad to hear that they can pay it back as I mean, the, the Minister of Finance will accept any check that is valid in, in return of the repayment. So that, that's not an issue at all. As I said earlier on, the government has no designs on the companies and want to own and operate them. Our only interest is that come 2009, we bailed you out, you have taxpayers' money, this government has a duty to ensure that that money is protected and returned. So everything else is not for discussion. The record indicates yeah, that hold on, Mr. Let, let, let me if it is the door, they aren't able to provide this check of $3 billion US dollars that they say um, is investors are willing to be made available. Is the government, or has it done maybe... Let me hear it again. 
That's what we said. That By whom? By one cult and reason. Let me ask you a question. If you, are, if you are owed money by anybody, especially the one that can't pay, and you hear that they are now going to come into funds to be able to pay you, wouldn't you be happy? Well, I'm very happy on behalf of taxpayers whenever I hear that. Based on the current well, assets that are, are, are sealed. I'm, not, I'm not today prepared to go into that. I leave those matters for the Minister of Finance, whose portfolio it is, and other people in the government and in the country. Those matters will evolve. It's not, it's not for me to pontificate on. I'm just confident that the current CLF assets can repay the debt to the state. Considering the global... I would not country. want to, as yet today, I would not want to make statements on that because I'm not in a position to answer those questions today. What, one final question on that issue. Um, in a liquidation... And that's the final question, eh? Yes, yeah, no, that's a, um, In a liquidation, the liquidator is compelled to accept the highest offer. What if the highest offer is a low figure. I mean, I'm talking about the assurances about the fire sale question and whether what guarantees. I don't know that, um, you know, what we have in place now is a provisional liquidator with specified circumscribed powers. And anything that he or she would do there would have to meet the approval of the court. And I don't think anybody can ask for more protection than that. And secondly, whatever happens after that, the facts of the circumstance is what will drive that. What the discovery of the facts, I just told you, one company was receiving 100% of the profits under the guise that it had 100% ownership, when in fact two other companies had 60% of the ownership. There is a lot to be discovered. And until the facts are discovered and put in a proper location, I think it is just speculative to talk about what price you dispose of this for or dispose at all. This matter, it is the end of the beginning. There's a lot to be discovered. A lot of this came to the attention of the government in recent months. And I want to address, finally, one other accusation made against the government by, by one of the experts on the morning experts that the government, this whole development, was a knee-jerk reaction on the part of the government, and the government acted out of peak. Well, let me tell you something. One doesn't get a refusal in August 2016 to get protection for taxpayers' money, and you take action in June or July 2017, and that is called, called knee-jerk. We were very cautious, we were very careful, we made sure that we gave every opportunity for the shareholders to cooperate with us. They were adamant. As a matter of fact, the Minister of Finance advised me that they sent back the shareholders agreement when they were asked to sign it. We didn't scandalize the country then. We, as a responsible and competent government, we took competent advice and we very carefully laid our steps and went to the court. And that is why we were confident that when we go to the court, the court would rule in our favor, giving us a certain position which we didn't have before. And those who are making comments contrary to the taxpayer's interests, it might very well be that the same way we are paid to represent the taxpayer, and I don't know anybody arguing about that, they know who they're representing, and I have no argument with them for representing their case. But our oath of office is to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago in their totality. negotiations for the extension of the agreement. In other words, why 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 did did we start like the month that the agreement was to I, be? I told you I had to answer in the parliament a few months ago. It must have been three, four months ago. Because the opposition obviously would have been aware that something was amiss. And they came to the parliament quite properly. And the opposition asked, I think it was Prime Minister's question time, and I had to answer. And the answer I gave them was no, the shareholders' agreement has not been signed. 
And I went on to tell the opposition, and by extension the country, that the government is seeking to persuade the other side to sign the agreement, because one person can't sign an agreement. An agreement must be between at least two parties. But you said that the agreement lapsed in August 2016. So I am asking, how long before that period? Because I, what, what I can't understand is why we will with directors on the board, why were we unaware that they were planning all this in the background? Well, again, and I, that that it, it might be very well be that the planning wasn't taking place on the board. That's a possibility. The planning may not have been taking place on the board. That's a logical possibility. But again, I don't want to go into those details. I don't have those facts. It appears that um, for the eight years gone by, there has been no AGM at this company. Again, I can't respond to that because I don't have that information. What I do know is that um, there were no audited financial statements, and in the absence of AGMs, I can't today answer that question. Maybe a little later on, somebody else can answer that question for you. And the other thing is, you talk about two sets of money, 11 and 7 and, and 5. Five interests, 11 no interest, and others. And others. The 5 billion, you get 7.5 billion. How did the government apply that 7.5 billion to the loan? <laughs> did you apply I think billion with the interest, or did you money, apply money, money is fungible? No, no, no. no, no. Well, okay, all right. You may not, you may not, you may not agree with me. Um, if you if you're asking me how it how it is shown on the books of the Ministry of Finance, I, yes, okay, but I can't answer you now because I don't have that information. Just remember, the cabinet just met and discussed this, you know. So these are very important questions. You were, you were in the cabinet. Well, you were in the cabinet. <laughs> I, get, I, I can assure you the legal advice that the government is getting is very good. And I can assure you also, right, that if it is that you're saying that you want to know where, when that check came in, where it was applied in the logbook or the ledger, I can't answer that. But what I do tell you, if we were owed $23 billion and we got $7 billion, all it did is reduce the overall debt, right? And I can't go any further today. Maybe when you see the Minister of Finance, who will have the accounts and the ledgers in front of him and there, he can tell you that. All right, Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, Mr. Reese, has said that the shareholders from the very beginning appear to go all the way to the Privy Council in this matter. Uh, is it safe to say the government is also prepared, if necessary, to take this matter to the Privy Council? As a taxpayer, what is your answer to that? Supposed to you, Prime Minister. As a taxpayer, the question is posed to you. What do you think the government should do? Well, I want to give the assurance. I want to give the assurance to the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago that, as far as we are aware, the doors of the Privy Council are open to all of us. Does the, does the government think it would reach that far, given the? We don't know. I mean, what, what we don't know, and I'm not going to speculate on that, except to say that the government will do any and all reasonable things to protect the interests of the taxpayer in this matter. Thank you very much. I think last, last, last question. You, did the legal advice consider minority interest in this company and the problems you can have? I'm sure that the quality of legal advice you would have got would have considered all aspects of it. Thank you very much.